Hi, this is Philip Cohen here with a short informal talk about COVID-19 preprints and the information ecosystem. You can see my contact information there. I'm happy to discuss this with you if you'd like to get in touch with me anytime. I like this uh, cartoon because it depicts sort of where, um, how we informally judge the seriousness of what's going on. If they're talking to a volcanologist um, on the news, that's pretty bad. If they're talking to an archeologist, probably not too much to worry about. You can see as far as COVID-19, virologist is pretty far over there towards uh, volcanologist. So that's potential trouble. And that's what we're talking about today. Um, just a little bit of background on information ecosystems, sort of the analogy that we use um, from uh, ecological studies to talk about how information works through society. We start at a foundational level with some key structures in the information landscape. Those are things like government agencies, news organizations, the publishers that publish scientific research. Um, those are the structures that information uh, is built on. Um, and then there's a system of access for how we're going to get those things. We use internet, we use devices, we have subscriptions, and there are paywalls, and of course it has to be in a language you speak, and, and so on. Uh, then there's a marketplace um, uh, to varying degrees of marketized, but there's a, there's a marketplace uh, on that layer on top of that where we generate sort of the demand side. There's information needs of people searching for information, people wanting information about things like public health, consumer information. Um, there's the production and movement of information around that goes on um, in that marketplace where providers uh, generate and disseminate. Uh, information through using their tools and platforms. Um, and then there's the actual use of uh, the information by the people who are sort of on the receiving end. And then it flows around in the system and it flows around through a network of influencers. And that's partly based on trust, based on uh, people's decisions on the individual level uh, or organizational level about who they're going to trust, what information they're going to use to, um, to serve their needs and to try to provide information to the people that might be relying on them. And finally, there's the impact level. So altogether, this is a, 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 a large, complicated, dynamic system. It's hard to get a grasp on, but I wanted to just give um, sort of a sense of the layers that we're working at. Uh, that we're looking at in this system. And then I'll move on to talk about what's going on uh, with the pandemic and uh, science now. Now, important to realize um, when we talk about um, peer reviewed science and the way we assume uh, science works, it has not always been this way. Um, there's a famous interaction between Albert Einstein and the Journal of Physical Review um, where he was extremely distressed to discover the editor of the journal had sent his paper to somebody else to review it before deciding to publish it. It turned out this particular paper was wrong and had to be corrected, but Einstein was offended, incensed. On the basis of this incident, I prefer to take my paper elsewhere. He didn't authorize it to be shown to anybody else. So that's 1936. Peer review, especially anonymous peer review, was completely offensive to Einstein, of course, he's Einstein. Um, but it's the general case that before the middle of the 20th century, um, journal editors were the ones who decided what to publish, and they consulted with experts at their own discretion, which doesn't mean there was no gatekeeping, and it doesn't mean there was no authority and no expert review, but it was editors who were in charge of it, and they decided you know, who would review what, um, and they were the gatekeepers. Then after World War II, as there was um, the threat of the constriction of research funding, uh, academics realized that they could lose control of this process if it was handled instead by um, other government agencies or so on without their, um, uh, without, their, um, uh, without their direct influence. And that's really when we see the mystique of peer review come up where academics really insisted that only academics could decide what was, um, what was trustworthy and valuable um, and that's when we got this idea of the anonymous peer review system and the, especially the idea that it was, this was essential for science to be considered trustworthy. Um, here's, uh, this is a good example, the Watson and Crick paper on um, the double helix structure of DNA, um, not peer reviewed. The editor just decided to publish it. Okay, so let's look at the process of science working. Um, and then we'll break out the, the communication uh, aspect of that. So we have this body of published results and the scientists who are getting ready to do their research 
uh, go through a search and discovery process where they um, find the, the relevant information from previous research for their um, area of interest. They develop their own research ideas, design projects to do, collect or gather the data that they need, analyze it, and then publish results again. They're, what they publish then goes back into the pool of established uh, research and this cycle goes on. Now you'll notice here that this, uh, you, you know, if you think about how this works, it doesn't mean that everything published is always right forever. Um, things are superseded, uh, things are added to, um, uh, and the process is um, not really cyclical, but it's really, um, you know, expands as it goes. Now, the peer review process as we know it in journal publishing happens really at that point between the, uh, the analysis of the data and the publication of the results. That's when we bring in these expert peers, uh, sometimes anonymous. Uh, uh, this effort is usually coordinated by publishers, especially journal publishers, and they're going by their own status uh, criteria. Who are these researchers? Are they reputable people? Where do they work? And then they're also consulting their uh, peer reviewers. Um, the process is very black box. We don't know exactly how it works. It all happens in secret. Uh, now, there are other places where evaluation goes on in the system. We don't think of it as peer review in that, in that specific sense. But after results are published, they can be elevated. For example, they can be given awards. Um, we have um, grant funding agencies that evaluate research ideas and decide whether or not to fund them. Uh, we have people who uh, uh, decide who's going to get jobs and who's going to have important jobs and so on. So there's a lot of um, sort of peer evaluation that goes on in the system besides that moment of publication that we tend to focus on. Now, when we talk about open science, um, and we're moving into what's happening now with preprints, um, open science advocates have uh, uh, seized on a few opportunities in this cycle um, to open and accelerate, to make more efficient uh, and more transparent the scientific process. So for example, um, study designs can be peer reviewed in a process called study pre-registration, where um, uh, people can evaluate the design before they see um, the results and decide if this, is, uh, if this looks like a credible study. Um, we have a lot of efforts going on to share materials and methods in, in uh, uh, repositories and so on that, that can, uh, other people can use to enhance their own work. And then um, the publishing itself doesn't just happen in academic journals, but goes um, uh, and, but can include preprints, which are more rapidly uh, disseminated, we'll talk about next, but also news media and social media and all the other ways um, that scientists disseminate their work. So let's talk about preprints, what are they? Um, sort of two, two main definitions of preprints that are relevant. One is the finished drafts of scholarly work, but not yet peer reviewed. So think of uh, the version of work the scientists are sending off to a journal to be reviewed. Another definition is after it is reviewed and it's accepted, but it hasn't been typeset and, and published by the journal, there's that version and people sometimes share that. That also can be called a preprint. So preprints are um, essentially before the typeset version that comes from a journal um, and in some stage of development. Uh, you see the major preprints, some of the major preprint servers here. Um, Archive uh, is the first one. The first big one comes from math and physics, started in the 1990s. Um, now with um, well over a million papers. Um, Bioarchive and then MedArchive um, came along in um, life sciences and biology and medicine. Um, and then in social sciences, we have Social Archive, that's, I'm the director of that, SciArchive and a number of other um, discipline-specific archives um, that all sort of work on similar principles of taking preprints, archiving, and disseminating them uh, uh, in, a more, uh, in a more rapid, more open, uh, way than traditional journals, so to speak. Now, in the uh, current pandemic environment, there's been an explosion of research and much of it in preprints. This paper by Fraser et al. finds in the first four months from January through April, 16,000 papers published uh, having to do with COVID-19. Uh, 6,000 of those are preprints, so a huge volume of work um, pre-peer review coming out available to the public. They also did some follow-up and found that a lot of these studies are published quite quickly in journals with few substantive changes, indicating the preprints were pretty good 
um, in pretty good shape when they were posted. Uh, some of these preprints have been shared thousands of times or tens of thousands of times and really helped shape uh, the discourse on COVID-19. As some of them have turned out to be wrong, um, uh, and uh, there's been controversy uh, with some of them, and that's been uh, part of what's raised the issue of should we be reading preprints and talking about them and sharing them and so on. Now, um, because we're dealing with medicine and people are very sensitive about, you know, you're going to give clinical advice, you're going to talk about specific medications and so on, doctors might be looking at these, the Med Archive and BioArchive together, they're run by the same organization, um, they're putting this caution on their, this, on their homepage now, caution. Preprints are preliminary reports that are not certified. They should not be relied on to guide clinical practice, should not be reported as established information. But preprints are all over the news. And so that's happening. How is it happening? Well, journalists and news organizations are using their own indicators of reliability. Who are these researchers? Where do they work? They'll talk about the Columbia study. Um, they might talk to other experts who are not involved in the research or not directly involved and say, what do you think? Is this reasonable? Should we write a story about this? Uh, they have their own assessment. The science journalists and reporters and editors have their own expertise um, and they can, read, uh, they can read and decide what to trust. And then there's the newsworthiness. Spelled wrong. Um, uh, how important is it? Do we need to get this out there um, uh, right now instead of waiting you know, uh, weeks or months um, for it to be published in a journal? So some of the things you've probably heard that are now sort of established knowledge in the public sphere around uh, COVID-19 have come from preprints. Um, for example, the estimates um, that uh, the number of deaths going on uh, in the country is far exceeds the number counted by um, the official statistics on COVID-19 indicating we're undercounting uh, infection-related deaths, probably. Page one of the Washington Post. Page one of the New York Times, if, the, if we had done the lockdown sooner, tens of thousands of lives would have been saved. That's also from a preprint published on Med Archive. Um, so uh, these things have, uh, have been tremendously influential. Um, every, uh, lots of people know about them. Here's another one. Men are doing more housework, um, says researchers. Well, this one, not on a preprint server, is published by the Council on Contemporary Families that does their own vetting of pre-published research. They publish it themselves, um, uh, but not in a journal and with a formal peer review process. Now, some of these preprints have been wrong, but then again, some of the published articles have been wrong. Here are some retractions from major journals like the New England Journal of Medicine, The Lancet, Annals of Internal Medicine, which have turned out to be uh, wrong and had to be retracted after getting a lot of attention. I include one here, uh, BioArchive preprint that was withdrawn um, after suggesting that the coronavirus was, uh, was made by humans because of a faulty analysis of the, the genetics of the virus. So, there have, been, uh, there have been errors uh, uh, among preprints and among published papers, um, and we have different systems of trust and authority, um, and the whole thing is moving very rapidly. So um, what do we trust and what do we believe? We know this whole system runs on trust. Um, it, normally it's formalized, um, and we have authorities that are sort of predetermined to be things we should trust. Science and nature and other important journals and, and, and big universities and so on. And so we use the status and the reputation, the legitimacy of um, the people who did the study and the people who published the study, the people who report on the study. There's a, there's a constant churning process of deciding who are we going to believe. Um, peer review is just one part of that. And this uh, crisis has really shown that. Um, the preprints have come out, have been tremendously uh, uh, successful at accelerating the pace of research and the efficiency uh, of getting that knowledge out there. And it has really, taxed the system of trust and made us made more explicit part of what's usually implicit. And one of the things that we now look at is transparency. Um, one of the ways that we evaluate whether or not we should believe a piece of research is, are they sharing their data and code and so on? Uh, have they made their process transparent? Uh, if they have, that indicates that they're um, more trustworthy. Now, uh, I want to talk a little bit at the end here about what you can do if you're a researcher. Um, uh, who works on, uh, not just on COVID related, but anything, one thing you can do is take steps to in publicly endorse work and, and make sure you only share work in your networks um, that you think is reliable. So uh, for example, the Plaudit tool, I really like, it's a Chrome, uh, uh, the browser extension you can install, I use Chrome, um, where uh, you can, um, if you have an ORCID uh, ID, you can uh, 
endorse any, any piece of scholarship. You can see here, I have endorsed the Watson and Crick article. Um, uh, and also, if I'm going to share a paper on Twitter, for example, here's a paper I shared about dog adoptions during the pandemic. Um, I'm giving it my endorsement. If you trust me from other, um, for already, for other reasons, then my tweet might mean something to you. So if you're a researcher, I just urge you to spend some of your time doing the work of sort of publicly endorsing things that you think are good. Um, I also think it's important for us to try to understand this ecosystem that we, uh, that we work in. Um, and then to make decisions um, with how we allocate our own labor um, to support those, um, those organizations and institutions that um, support open science and support our values, to practice open science ourselves, to publish preprints when they're ready to help accelerate and transfer, uh, transmit knowledge out, out to other researchers and the public, and just decide who we're gonna edit journals, review, write for, um, uh, to think uh, of ourselves as part of this system and try to push the system in a positive direction while we do our work. Just a couple of uh, final readings, uh, 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 readings I can suggest for futures for researchers in general, the Open Science by Design Report from the National Academies. For journalists, this is a nice uh, resource on how, when and how to cover preprints. Uh, for people in social science and sociology in particular, I've written this report uh, scholarly communication that maps out this system uh, more from the point of view of sociology. So that's quick overview, preprints, COVID-19, the information ecosystem. I hope it was helpful.